I am Christian Grönros. This is a, a, a part of a series of lectures on principles of service management. The topic today is service productivity. What is service productivity? How should it be managed? How to understand it? Now what's important to realize is that although there, there is a theory and the methods and instruments and measurement models of productivity, they all come from product manufacturing. And service productivity is not the same thing. It has to do basically with the same, uh, that is that uh, the firm should be uh, efficient and effective. But one can't uh, apply traditional productivity models in uh, service organizations. They have to be uh, applied have to be changed and have to be quite radically changed to some part. Now, this uh, talk will be on what is it, how to understand it, not that much about how to measure, because we can't develop measurement models before we know what it is. Just a few comments towards the end about uh, measurement and measurement uh, challenges. So, principles of service management, service productivity. Now, one thing that is really important to realize is that productivity really is a dangerous concept if we apply it in the wrong way. It's, it's a product-based concept and uh, it's so often used by service firms just because there is really no well-established uh, concept about how to become efficient and effective in a service organization. So firms, firms easily then just turn to the traditional productivity concepts and not really paying enough attention to the fact that they are developed for a very different context. Manufacturing, which is a closed system, whereas service uh, is an open system. So, more about that. Uh, what happens, you see, wh when you tr uh, transfer traditional productivity methods, measurements into services, that the firm easily falls into a strategic management trap. What easily happens is that the internal atmosphere suffers and that leads again to quality problems, deteriorating image, lost customers, and in the end, possibly, even probably, financial problems. So one has really to take this seriously. Don't apply traditional productivity models and concepts in service organizations without thinking carefully through how to apply them and what is service productivity, really. Now, looking at the traditional productivity models, they come from uh, product manufacturing, as I said, and uh, there is a formula which uh, is like this, that productivity is output over input given a constant quality assumption. Now, this means that you can either change the input resources in a way that they are more cost efficient and you produce as much as before uh, and the quality will remain the same and you sell as much as before and you get the same revenues as before but costs go down. Or you can also um, produce more with uh, new input resources. Cost level may remain on the same as before but now you can produce more and uh, if you can sell more you will get more revenues in both cases, productivity improves. You are more efficient and more effective. But the important thing here is to realize is the constant quality assumption here. If quality of the output, the physical products here, do not remain constant, then this formula doesn't apply. It will give wrong guidance and lead most probably to a strategic management trap. Now, in manufacturing, it is not easy, but it's fairly easy to make sure that the quality of the product that come out uh, of the processes remain constant. You can maintain the quality of the product. And therefore, this formula is very often, when uh, we talk about it in firms, simplified. So that we just say that uh, the productivity is output over input. Now, output is how much can we sell revenues? Input is with what costs can we produce, so costs. And uh, the constant quality assumption says that revenues will remain fixed, whereas uh, costs are variable. So the productivity formula will become fixed 
revenues over variable costs. Now, if you think about services here and service organization, where there's a lot of interactions between the firm and the customer, when the, where, where, where the customers participate in parts of the service process, then we realized also that this is a problem because uh, productivity becomes in this way a total internal issue for the firm. A customer is not involved in any way. Customer influence is not involved in any way and not taken into account in any way. And these uh, are actually the basic reasons for the problems. Um, fixed revenues of a variable costs. So let's look at the service profit logic. Because that also shows why the traditional productivity models do not work properly and often not at all in uh, service uh, context. Now this is the um, service profit logic. Profit, revenues minus cost. Revenues comes, yes, from effective sales and marketing, but revenues also come from effective other business functions in the interactive parts where the customer meets the various people and processes and systems of the service provider. And this is supported by a supportive part, uh, what often is called back office operations, which uh, support the interactive part and the, the possibility of the reacting part to provide good service quality. So there is a effect here that is not in traditional product manufacturing and in the product profit logic. And that is the red arrow here, which says that costs, yes, are depend on uh, how efficient we are in our operations, but our operations also influence the possibilities to get revenues. It's not only traditional sales and marketing that, that uh, take care of, of uh, the generation of, of revenues. And what this really means, well, it is that revenues are seldom fixed. That's what the red arrow here implies. So let's look at this in another way. The, the internal efficiency, that is, how cost efficiently are we operating and external effectiveness, that is how can we get revenues through the level of perceived quality that, that we can uh, offer. Uh, they are intertwined in service operation and we could use an illustration like this. When the, the black circle to the left here is external effectiveness, that is uh, what do customers think about the service quality and are they prepared to pay money for it? that is revenue management. And the black circle to the, to the right is internal efficiency, that is how cost efficiently are we uh, running our various uh, functions in, 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 in the business. Now, the traditional productivity models assume that these two circles are not intertwined, more than very, very parts of it. But in service we know that they are intertwined to a large extent. Because the red, the big red area here, that's the interactive part of the service organization where the customer meets the resources and processes of the organization. And uh, if we cannot handle this part properly, we are going to make mistakes. And for example, handling this part, which is here indicated with red, where internal ef uh, efficiency and external effectiveness are intertwined, if we manage that, only taking internal efficiency into account, which the traditional productivity formula, formula easily makes us do, we are going to get into problems because we, external effectiveness will probably start to deteriorate and we get in the strategic management trap. So the question is, what really are the conclusions of all this? And just to sum up, the three conclusions. First of all, the constant quality assumption doesn't apply in service organizations, in service context. We can never assume that uh, changing the internal efficiency of the operations will not have effect on external effectiveness through customers' perception of service quality. And uh, secondly, cost efficiency and revenue effectiveness, that is internal efficiency and, and external effectiveness, service quality must not be managed separately. 
And the traditional productivity formulas assume that we can do that because there is no really interdependence between internal efficiency and external effectiveness. And that means, in the end, that traditional productivity models are not applicable as such uh, in service context. And let's, let's show this with a few illustrations. First, uh, let's take the good case. That is, applying this traditional productivity formula, productivity is output over input, and changing input will not affect the quality of the output, and the productivity will uh, change and probably improve if, it, if we become more cost efficient. Uh, that's how it should be in product um, manufacturing when applying productivity uh, instruments. So let's look at this. The, the x-axis is time. The y-axis means that the further up, the better. And there are three variables on it. There's product, productivity as cost efficiency, internal efficiency, uh, product quality, and profit. And this is how it goes in product manufacturing if we don't make serious mistakes anywhere. And that is we improve the efficiency of our, our operations. That means costs go down. Costs goes down, higher cost efficiency. Now, because of the constant quality assumption, the product quality will not change, which means revenues will remain the same. And that means that profits will go up. Of course, not as dramatically as indicated in this illustration, but this just shows the tendency, how it goes. This is how the productivity formula should work and how it works in product manufacturing, because it is a closed system. Now, let's take the bad case. Applying the traditional productivity formula in a service context. Now, the outcome is totally different. Same uh, illustration, basically, but let's say now again, try to improve the uh, operations, the various functions to become more cost efficient. That means that traditional productivity according to the model goes up because we become, become more cost efficient. Eternal efficiency is improved. However, as the um, constant quality assumption doesn't apply, quality most probably will go down. And remember, we talk about quality as perceived by the customer because that's what is important and relevant for decision making in business. <coughs> so perceived quality will go down, which means that we will get less and less revenues, which means that profit, prof profit will suffer. And uh, in some cases, we won't improve profit at all. In some cases, we might improve profitability a little bit if quality doesn't go much too much. But far too often, I would say this is the normal more my chaos, profit will, profit will start to go down from the level where it was when all this started. So this is the bad case. And it occurs almost always in service context. So we need to handle productivity with care. Then there's another thing which I like to point out here. It's an illusion when service managers or managers in, in, in service uh, businesses are applying uh, traditional uh, productivity methods, which often is done, as I said. And, and that is, first, everything looks OK. So let's go to the illusion. It looks like this. We start by improving internal efficiency, applying manufacturing models, and costs go down. And what happens very often in the beginning is that uh, profits improve. And profits improve because quality doesn't go down first. It may even improve. Now, the reason for this is that there are bureaucratic processes, overlapping processes, slack in the organization which creates problems for uh, the production of good service quality. So when we take out this bureaucracy from the organization, quality won't suffer. And in very many cases, customers will feel, hey, it's easier to have to do with this firm. And they will perceive that especially the functional quality of the service process improves. And this gives an impression that traditional productivity methods work. But at some point, we come to this breaking point indicated here, where this doesn't work like this anymore. 
because now bureaucracy has been taken out of the organization. And uh, managers easily get the, the, the impression that this works well, let's continue taking out more inefficiency out of the organization and improve cost efficiency. But what that happens is that productivity doesn't improve anymore. Internal efficiency improves, yes, we can get out more costs, become more internally efficient, but customers start to perceive that the service become problematic for them. They don't find the persons they like to talk to. It will take longer time to get to the systems. That they will not get answers to questions as quickly as before. And uh, all these sorts of things happen and perceived service quality start going down. And then of course, customers not prepared to pay money for this. And at some point profit will start to go down. And the risk here is that managers go too far beyond this breaking point. Not realizing that we get into trouble and we are starting to fall in down in this strategic management trap where the internal atmosphere is suffering, which leads to lower perceived service quality, which leads to deteriorating image, and which in the end leads to financial problem because of loss of profits following the loss of customers. So one has to be very careful. It may and often does look good in the beginning, but then at some point it starts to turn worse. And we have to make sure that we know when are we here. Now then the question that often is asked is how do we know as a manager when we are there at the breaking point? There's no simple answer to that question because th th there's no key performance indicator of any sort that would as one single indicator tell us that now we're there. Now we have to change the way we, we are uh, trying to, to manage the business. We have to follow a number of various uh, indicators here. We can look at uh, customer satisfaction measurements, yes. We can look at employee satisfaction measurements. We can look at uh, employee absence. We can look at how do we suffer from extraordinary costs. For example, because we have to, to, to employ uh, extra uh, people because of sickness leave or ab sickness absence or absence for some reasons. Or uh, we can try to see that uh, they, they, we get more difficulties to get the price that we are asking for. Or we realize we are losing customers. Market share goes down, but that we see far too late normally because of the way market share is measured. But there are all these indicators that uh, all tell the same thing, that careful, we have reached the breaking point and passed over it. And, uh, we need to follow these and understand that, that negative uh, developments on, on these indicators, and there may be more of them, uh, tells us that we can't start, continue uh, running the business towards more efficiency as we did before. Because now we're taking out the overlapping processes, the bureaucracy, the slack of the organization. So this illusion is important to keep in mind and understand so we don't go too far. Now, where is it then in service organizations like this that all goes wrong, most probably, when uh, we apply traditional productivity methods? Well, it is a very simple reason and that is that constant quality is not what, what, uh, what is the fact here. Instead, when we are changing the input resources, output resources change, that is, we have variable quality. So the formula in this simple format in service productivity would be that productivity is output over input given variable quality instead of constant quality. And this tells us that we m cannot manage the input part separately from the output part. Traditional productivity, we say output is okay, will produce the same quality, sales and marketing, traditional marketing will take care of revenues. And that doesn't work in a service organization. Because um, more cost efficient input resources this isn't necessarily something that customers appreciate and are prepared to pay money for. 
and uh, therefore it doesn't necessarily have a profit, uh, positive impact on profit. And uh, it's more the rule than not that it will have a negative impact on profit if we do not take into account the variable quality assumption that we are have here. Now, all this goes back to the fact that service is a totally different um, situation than uh, traditional manufacturing. And uh, let's look at that, at the difference between the assumptions here, the characteristics of product manufacturing and the characteristics of service uh, organization and service uh, processes. There are three, in this case, and for, for productivity at least, important aspects to take into account. Looking at product manufacturing, it is a closed system. Now, of course, uh, product manufacturing is, m is changing, moving towards modular product, product, uh, production, where customers can come in and say, I want this module and this module and put together the car like that or, or, or my jeans like that to take a traditional uh, example, Levi's jeans, the first real example talked about uh, customization of production of, of making jeans. That is, you, 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 you produce modules and the customer can choose to put this and this together. We have a CAD CAM systems that make makes it possible for customers to come in or just influence parts of the production system. The car makers are using it to some extent, so we can come in and decide. Nike used this where we can get in and design shoes to, 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 to some extent again. And there are other examples. But uh, what happens there is that the closed system is partly opened. But then it's not traditional product manufacturing anymore. It's something that starts to resemble the service process more and more. Uh, starts to resemble it. The basis is still product manufacturing. But let's stick to the uh, what still is the, 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 the uh, dominating way products are, are manufactured, and that is in closed systems, whereas services are open systems. Customers do not participate in the production of a physical product. To some extent today, yes, I just went through a few cases where that is, but traditionally and in the dominating situations today, they're not participating. We just have to take what comes out of it at face value. And, uh, that's not the case in services. Customers participate in the service process and the interactions between the customer and the, and, and the people and the uh, other resources and systems of the service providers uh, take place. And finally, product quality is therefore not affected by changes in the input resources in manufacturing, whereas the perceived quality is influenced by changes in the input resources. Now, this is the basic reality the differences between products and services. Now, today we, we want to say that there actually are no, no real differences f between products and services. And th th that is, to some extent, it's of course true. If you look at the logic, the business logic, talking about service logic versus a goods logic, and if we can apply a service logic on product manufacturing, and there, there, in that case, there really are di not differences between products and services. But when we come into, uh, let's call it micromanaging services and products, productivity, efficiencies, kind of a micromanaging part, here there are differences that we need to really keep, keep in mind. So, going further here, how should the service productivity be understood? And uh, how should a service productivity formula or function really look like. And there are three variables that are important. Two of them I have com commented upon so far. First of all, efficiency of the service processes, that is internal efficiency or managing costs. And the other is uh, the perceived service quality, which is uh, external effectiveness or, or managing revenues. But then there's a third aspect also here, and a th that, that has to be taken into account, and that is resource utilization. Managing demand could be called uh, capacity efficiency, because uh, that's a well-known um, challenge for service organizations that 
because um, the stream of customers that come to the service establishment and want to, to use the service is not constant, but it, it, it varies. In product manufacturing, sales varies as well, but then we, we, there we can use as buffers uh, stocks. We just put in stock the products we haven't been able to sell today, and we can probably sell them tomorrow together with the ones we produce tomorrow. Now, in service organizations, that is not possible to do it in, 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 in this way. So the variability in, in demand uh, influences the internal efficiency of the organization. The more demand there is, the, the, the better internal efficiency, because we can use all resources, no idle resources. The lower demand there is, the lower internal efficiency, but we probably have idle resources people who just sit and wait for somebody to serve, and resources that are just there and cost money, the capital costs money, are not aren't used because there are no, 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 no customers. But in addition to this, the uh, capacity efficiency has an effect on external effectiveness as well. Because the less demand, the higher the external effectiveness. We're not too many there, so that's, uh, there's no queues, no lines, and that means we can get quicker service. Uh, if we go to a, a, a restaurant, if we go to bank office, if we want to check in to the airline. And on the other hand, if there are more customers there at the same point in time, if everything takes longer time, we may not find the person we like to be served by, if you can talk about that kind of establishment, and so on and so forth. So, Capacity efficiency is also something that has to be taken into account in a service productivity model. We can formulate this in, 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 in two, with two functions. That service productivity is a function of internal efficiency, external efficiency, and capacity efficiency. But another way of saying this is that service productivity is a function of managing costs, managing revenues, and managing demand, and mind you in simultaneous processes. This is these three uh, parts of management have to be managed simultaneously, not in separate processes as in traditional product manufacturing, but in a, if not the simultaneous processes, in processes that are integrated somehow so that we have control over what are the external effects by changing input resources? And what are the internal effects by changing the, the, the demand through, for example, more effective sales or more effective traditional marketing? So this is what we are building upon. Trying in a service productivity model to fit together these three managerial areas internal efficiency, managing cost, external efficiency, external effectiveness, managing revenues, and um, capacity efficiency, managing demand. And the model becomes complicated. And the measurement instruments that would follow from this and will follow from this are not as easy to use as we used to in product manufacturing when uh, measuring productivity and measuring productivity improvements. Which, of course, is problematic, problematic because this causes problems uh, for those who are supposed to use this, this uh, measurement instrument. But unfortunately, this doesn't uh, take the problem away. If traditional product management models are used in service organizations, wrong decisions are most probably made. And if traditional measurement models of measuring productivity from product manufacturing is used in service organization, wrong decisions are most probably made because of the reasons I've laid out here. So what does a model look like? And admittedly, it looks complicated. But let's, let's go through it anyway. Let's start with the input side. The input side... Uh, has two basic components. It is the, the service supplier, the firm, which has resources that are used in the service process, but it's also the customer. And mind you, fellow customers at the same time in the system, in the restaurant, or on, on, on the aircraft, or uh, on the internet. And, and 
they also put their resources into the service process. Now this is new. This is not anything that is, is important in uh, productivity and product manufacturing because uh, the customer only buys what comes out in the end. Now, when changing product manufacturing, as I uh, showed a while ago, to modular production and mass customization and cut come impact from, from the customers, customers are starting to put resources into, into the, the, the processes. But as I said, manufacturing starts to resemble more and more service processes then. But traditionally, they are not there, the customer's resources. So these are the input resources. And however these resources are managed, they influence the cost efficiency. Now, the customer may use how many resources they want and wish. And that's not a problem. And that, 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 that's not a problem for internal efficiency, as long as the customers are happy with doing that. But that will influence how much resources the service provider has to use and can use and will use and how the service provider's resources can be used efficiently. And of course, if we look at what uh, trends we, we, we've seen for a while, that is moving uh, activities to the customer, check-in at the airport, not to speak of the inter internet banking from before, and other situations where we as consumers are required to take over service product production uh, actions well, what the firm's doing is moving resources from their own inputs to the customer's inputs. And of course, in that way, hoping to improve the internal efficiency of the service process, thereby, of course, being more cost efficient. And when consumers accept this, because this is something we think we can do, we like to do it, and we, th we, we feel that the quality we get is improving, or at least maintained, then we will do this. Now, then comes the more complicated part of all this. Because then, then we have the service process where all these resources are used. Now, we need to remember here that service processes are complicated processes. And as, as the, the model here shows, there is the service provider doing things alone. There are provider and customer co-producing -produ activities that is in the interactions of various sorts, interactions with people, inter interactions with systems, interactions with the internet, interactions with vending machines, interactions with anything. And then there are situations when the custom customers are producing the service alone without really any interactions. There are those, they, they are not that easy to, to, to find, but you, you, you must think about such situations as well. Now, the arrows here from the service provider's resources is just shows what is affected by the service provider's resources. And the arrows from the customers in, uh, and fellow consumers' uh, inputs here show where do their uh, activities influence. Now, thick arrow means direct influence, dotted arrows mean indirect uh, inf uh, influence in, in some way. Now, I won't here go into any details about this, just showing that we need to take into account these many complicated effects that there are, so we don't make mistakes when we want to, to, to understand and then manage, not to talk about measure, productivity effects of changes in the input resources. Now moving on, we come here to the output. Outputs can be divided into two parts. Quantity and quality. Quantity is how much is produced, how much service is produced, meaning how many customers can be catered to at the same time. And quality means, of course, the perceived service quality, the technical quality of the outcome, what the customer gets, and the functional quality of the service process, how the customer perceives the process itself. And all this is filtered through the image of the service provider. If customers think that this is a service provider, they are going to, for example, uh, say that, all right, it took a little bit longer this time, but that's fine, it's a good firm. You know, and if a customer thinks that, uh, I don't know why I'm here, I dislike this firm, I know, know only bad things of this firm, and then something goes wrong, I'm gonna may say that I will for sure never come back. So image is important as a filter here. Now, the Output quantity has an effect on demand. The more we can produce, 
the more demand we can cater to. The more demand there is, the less we can, uh, or let's put it this way, the more demand there is, the higher internal efficiency. And the less demand there is, the more we can produce good quality for the persons and higher external effectiveness. So the output quantity has either a, 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 an effect on demand and their capacity efficiency, efficiency, which from the firm's point of view is either good, we can show more customers, which may be bad for the customer, or bad, we have less customers to serve idle resources, which on the other hand may be good for the customers, because this means less waiting times, I find the right person, I get advised more easily and, 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 and all those things. Now then, quality. Quality has an effect on external effectiveness, of course. If the quality is perceived better, external effect effectiveness is better, and customers are prepared to pay the price we ask for it without asking for discount, or are prepared to pay a higher price, and this means that external uh, effectiveness will improve. Now all these three streams influence in the end the productivity of the service organization. Internal efficiency through the input resources and how they are used, demand efficiency through the relationship between resources we have and demand, so how little or how much idle resources do we have, and the perceived service quality. All these streams influence service productivity. And from a management point of view, they all have to be taken into account. Now, how do you measure this with one simple measurement instrument? You can't. Not at least traditional types of, of instruments. You have to find other ways of doing that. And in the end, we're going to find out that what we actually are talking about when we come in here to service productivity is costs and revenues and how costs are influenced by capacity efficiency and revenues are influenced by capacity efficiency. And uh, we are measuring profits. Or perhaps even profitability if we add capital aspect here. So uh, the conclusion really is that on a global level, the productivity of a whole service operation we can't measure anything called productivity. We must measure profit. And that is productivity. That is service productivity. Service productivity is a more complicated thing to understand and to measure. In product manufacturing, we can use a shortcut to, shortcut to all this because uh, quality is constant and therefore revenue is constant. So we just measure the effects of changes in the cost level of the input resources. And um, <coughs> that's, of course, is a much easier thing to do. But before coming, coming to, to some of the actions and, 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 and some comments on, on measurement, there's another aspect that is important here to think about too, and that is the dynamics of service productivity. Uh, could call it the produ uh, productivity as a reciprocal learning process. Now again, uh, um, it, it, it's a model that uh, looks complicated, but really isn't. There are two parts of it. Up here, it's the customer's learning process. And down here, soon, the service provider's learning process will appear. Now, let's say that the relationship between the customer and the firm continues with time. So the customer gets to know the service firm, how it functions, <coughs> the people there, how the people behave, what they know, what they doesn't know, what they need to tell about themselves, and so forth. And going here to the left, this will narrow what we could call a customer provider competence gap. The customer knows better what to say, what to tell them, and so forth. And this will mean that the customer can, can uh, be a more uh, intensive participator in the service process. And all this means that internal efficiency in the end will improve. The firm can produce more effectively if the customer knows how to participate more efficiently. And this will also, mind you, have an effect on the customer's perception of the quality. That is, this leads to higher external effectiveness as well. And if we go to the right, 
the customer learns what to expect because I know what they can do and what they cannot do in this service firm. And if that is something I accept, this is an acceptable level of service for me, that is fine. And this leads to a better match between expectations and experiences. And this leads to higher external effectiveness here. Yeah. The customer will feel, I know now what to expect and I get it. So I perceive the, the quality as, as uh, uh, better or at least it is maintained, probably improved. And this, of course, also have an effect on internal efficiency because we know what the customer expects so the service provider can produce this service more accurately, quicker and correctly. And that will keep the costs of the service processes down. Now, down here, we look at the same thing from uh, the service provider's point of view and see what are the effects on the customer and on the service provider. In the middle here, Provider familiarize, familiarizes itself with the customer. Well, going to the left, the provider becomes aware of the customer's competencies. What do we need to tell the customer? What can we expect that the customer knows about how to behave in the process, what to tell us, what to do, and so on and so forth. And this leads that, again, to the same effect. The, the firm can allow more customer participation, and this will have an effect a positive effect on internal efficiency. And customers will feel that this is okay too, so external effectiveness will probably improve as well. And when we go to the right here, in the firm-driven processes, well, when the provider knows more about the customer, the provider learns about customer-specific needs and expectations and wishes and knows the basic processes behind the needs. And this means better tailored service. We can more accurate, accurately take care of the customer, which of course improves service quality, that is, leads to higher external effectiveness. And this will at the same time have the effect that the firm can do this more efficiently, so we will get higher internal efficiency as well. So, we will in the end, when this learning process continues, and the two parties here, the service provider and the customer, more and more learn about each other, will lead to a positive effect of service productivity from this side, higher internal efficiency, and a positive effect on service provider from this side, higher in external effectiveness. They will both have a positive effect on ser service productivity, which then will improve. And when the firm understands the customer more, the customer understands the firm more, they can participate together better Capacity efficiency will also improve because we can quicker, perhaps even with less resources, service the customer and the customers will be equally satisfied with the quality as before, perhaps even more satisfied. So we have resources to take care of even more customers. So capacity efficiency also improves. Now this is something that there is absolutely nothing about in the literature on service management and service product productivity other than the article from which uh, this model is, is, is taken. It, it, it's uh, something that service management research hasn't looked at at all. Uh, not to speak about service productivity, but there is very little about service productivity as such in the literature as well. So here is really something with a very high potential that should be developed much further because it, it has very powerful um, managerial effects. Understanding how service productivity is a learning process, and how important it is to learn about each other, which of course takes this back to the idea of customer relationships and relationship marketing. F also from this point of view, it's a good idea to try to get customers that will stay with the firm and uh, buy continuously from the same firm. So we have a continuing relationship with, with, with the customers. Now, let's then come to what to do more in detail. And what I can offer here is, is a few rules of thumb or, or guidelines. Uh, they're not co comprehensive in any way. But they are rather important uh, guidelines that can be used in almost all situations 
as a, as a, as a basis for uh, taking action in, to improve service productivity. Now, first thing is very obvious. Eliminate bureaucracy and overlapping processes because there's so often in service firms lots of that. And <coughs> that's, that's uh, something to, to think about. First, do we have really unnecessary processes and necessary resources? The other thing is jump to a new technology level. And I say jump because if we really can introduce a new technology level, it really is a jump in productivity because that normally means that cost efficiency will improve dramatically. And if we can do that so that external effectiveness uh, isn't hurt, then the productivity effect is even dramatic. Um, think about internet banking. We think it's a very good service, high quality. You don't want to go unnecessarily to a bank office. And the banks? Well, they are saving a lot of costs. So it is, it is a good way of improving service productivity. The airlines are trying to do that with check-in uh, machines. And in the end, probably uh, we'll, uh, we will see the same effect. We learn it and we think it's a good idea and c the airlines will save uh, money. Then the third point here is improve quality and external effectiveness by moving costs towards the customer interface. What that means is make a distinction between good costs and bad costs. Good costs and bad costs. Now bad costs are bureaucracy maintaining costs. Good costs are quality maintaining costs. Now bad costs, that is of course something that, that is uh, due to, to bure bureaucracy in the processes but also that we do unnecessary things. We have normally bad cost can be found in uh, unnecessary staff functions, unnecessary managerial supervisory layers in the organization, and all those things. So start to think about that if you want to become more productive. That's where you should start. Not start with the good costs, which are found in the customer interface, in the interactive part of the firm, and also in the supporting part of the firm, back offices and so forth. And, and um, if possible, strengthen the good costs and do that by save on the bad costs where you can do it, where it doesn't have any effect on the business and on quality management. So as it says, uh, eliminate or decrease bad costs, strengthen and maintain good costs. Now bad costs is of course not all staff related costs and uh, managerial layer related costs. It's unnecessary staff related costs and unnecessary managerial and supervisory level costs that are bad costs of course. And then build on customers willingness to take on some co-production mm, tasks. Now, I've used the example of internet banking and, and uh, airline check-in here. And that is something that can be used, should be used, but only when customers will perceive this as a good thing, that will feel that, yes, this means something positive for us. We want to do this. Uh, we feel that the perceived quality is maintained and in the best case improved. So that people be careful there. And then fifthly, learn about the customer's processes and expectations. So we really can capitalize on the dynamic aspect of service productivity. Learn from the customer and learn from the interaction between the firm and the customer. So these are five uh, uh, guidelines of, of, of how to take actions, how to think and then take actions to, to improve service productivity. Now, final observation here, which relates partly to measurement and the measurement challenge. But um, first, uh, before that, we need to understand what I briefly commented upon earlier, and that in traditional manufacturing, the productivity concept actually is a proxy for profit management. It's a shortcut to managing profit and profitability. It's a proxy that can be used because of the constant quality assumption, which means that revenues will come more or less automatically. 
if we have effective sales and traditional marketing. And of course, if we have a good product in, in the beginning, but it was it good in the beginning, it will be good after the productivity changes as well. So it's a shortcut to managing profit uh, and, and uh, that is possible because of the constant quality assumption and the fact that revenues can be considered fixed. Now, in services, this shortcut is not possible. We just cannot manage productivity in this simplified way. And the problem here is that so many service firms in the public sector as well, not only in, in the private sectors, <coughs> are making these mistakes and trying to apply this shortcut when attempting to become more uh, efficient and that through that earn money or avoid financial problems that seem to be around the corner. It doesn't work. So service productivity is more a model of profit management than a profit in a model of, of uh, uh, a part of that, that we traditionally call productivity in product manufacturing. So it's a model of profit management without shortcuts. Now, however, managing efficiency and effectiveness can be done on various levels. If you look at the total firm, we can call it global service productivity. We must take this very seriously that we need to really look at both revenues and cost and revenue and cost effects simultaneously. However, uh, we can do it differently if, it, if we look at partial efficiency. Let's say we go into the, to the back office of a restaurant, meaning the kitchen, where the customer doesn't participate very much. It's a supportive part of the organization. There we can try to use more traditional ways of measuring productivity. Ex for example, what are the costs of the input resources we use there? That is, all the, the, the utensils used, all the investments in the kitchen, the, the costs of the employees, the costs of the raw materials, the costs of the process. And see, can we find ways of still producing the same quality of what comes out of there with more cost efficient uses? And a, constant quality assumption may apply. Please observe, may apply, because it doesn't necessarily apply. And when we look at uh, continuing with the restaurant in, 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 in the restaurant uh, itself, and look at the people coming in, the guests, so we can try to measure and say the more, the more tables that are occupied, the higher service productivity. Perhaps, because we may, it may be possible to maintain the same level of service quality if we have enough resources with more people in the room. So if we have, for example, 90% of, of, of the tables occupied, that may mean, I mean, we measure it this way, better service productivity as compared to when we have 60% occupied. But this may not be like that either, because if this has a negative effect on the service as perceived by the customer, then we have to think about a more global measurement of productivity. So we have to be very careful here how we measure uh, productivity in service context. And with that, uh, this talk comes to an end. Thank you. <laughs>